Hello and welcome to season two, episode one of the Property Investors Podcast. Now it's been about 18 months since we were last on the air and things have obviously gone mad over the last 18 months or pretty much over the last 12 months things have been changed a lot. Um, in personal circumstances my stuff's all changed as well and I kind of got myself to a point now where I thought that it'd be a really good time to bring the podcast back and we've got some exciting things lined up and a few changes. The main change is we've gone video so as well as catching us on Spotify, Apple Music, all your podcast streaming stations, you'll also be able to catch us on YouTube and you'll be able to catch us on Facebook video. So we're, we're going we're going full 2020 Zoom experience. Um, but today I've got a fantastic guest. He's a good friend of mine, a chap called Robin Holmes. He's very active. Um, he's had a very interesting um, journey from um, having his own personal portfolio that he's built up as a bit of a side hustle uh, while he was working at the police. And then he got to a point where he could find the overlap and he said, I don't want to do the police anymore. I want to move into property. And he's had a really interesting story moving from there. So he's a perfect first guest. I've also got a really exciting announcement that I'm going to make right at the end of the episode just to keep you hooked in. But that will give you a real good idea of what the plan is moving forward with the show and what is what is in store. So without further ado, I hope you really enjoy episode one of season two. And yeah, so here we go. And we're recording. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Hello, Mr. Webster. How are you? Yeah, very well, mate. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Thanks for having me on. No, no, pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for being the first guest of season two, episode one. That's exciting. It I, is. Never, never thought, I'd, I never thought I'd hear from you guys again. And yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. Well, what we'll do is we'll dive straight in because it's always best that way. So what I'll do is I'll ask you to introduce yourself, give us a little bit of it, like background of your upbringing, who you are, where you're from, some, some sort of life experiences, and then we'll just have a casual conversation and we'll just build it out from there. So, so take it away. Cool. Sounds good. Okay. So my name is Rob Holmes. Uh, I'm a property investor, I guess. Um, I'll, I'll jump straight in and just say I, I kind of hate the word, but I guess I am an entrepreneur. Uh, I feel icky saying it, but but there we go. That's, that's the well, I'll tell you what, I, I've always said that an entrepreneur, someone calls you an entrepreneur and I'm calling you an entrepreneur. So you can... <laughs> yeah, it's hard to call yourself <laughs> not, It's not a self-declared <laughs> title. It's, uh, it's a characteristic and you definitely have it. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> so, yeah, so I was, uh, I've, I've been brought up in Sussex pretty much my whole life. Um, started work when I, I think on my first job I was 15 and uh, I was I was like a shelf stacker checkout boy for about I think my pay was a, I want to say about two pound 13 an hour. Where was that? <laughs> That's slave labor you're not that old and that wasn't below. <laughs> that was at ESK that was my first job ESK. ESK yeah. I'm right so just just a little uh, silence ESK my nan loved ESK it was like a, just a massive, like anyone that's not from Eastbourne probably doesn't know what ESK is. It's this massive shop that sells everything but nothing. Yeah, it's like a discount shop, isn't it? Yeah, and but, but, but Christmas fantastic. stuff, the Christmas stuff was like, yeah. the, it was huge for ESK, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was good, it was good. So, um, so I started there and then I moved to the David Lloyd. So I was flipping burgers in the David Lloyd uh, kitchen um, and the bar and I was there for a little bit. Uh, and then I did a bit of traveling. So I did a bit of traveling for six months and then I came back and I joined the police and then I was a police officer for almost 10 years. I didn't quite make 10. I think I got to nine years and seven months or something like that. Um, and kind of when I, the, the, the same year that I started in the police, um, the year after I bought my first property and I kind of did it as a hobby as I was in the police and I had a couple of businesses as well, a um, couple of franchises. Um, I was kind of doing all of that and property was never my main thing. It was always, um, a hobby. It was always a side thing. It was one of those ones where, um, I, I read rich dad, poor dad when I was about 18, 19 and, uh, and I just knew property was a good investment. Um, but I didn't really know or understand it. I just knew that I should be buying it. So I would kind of do the the standard thing of save a deposit, buy somewhere, sit on it for, for three or four years, wait for it to go up in value, save another little deposit, buy another one, save another deposit, buy another one. And then once two or three of them had gone up in value, you do the refinance and that gets you the deposit for another one. Um, but it's kind of slow and painful doing it that way. So I got to uh, six or seven years into my kind of 
police career. So what, just to touch on that, so, so what was you doing in the police? By the way, the irony that your name is Robin Holmes and you as a police officer is never left. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Do you know what? So many people don't, don't put that together. Uh, do you, was I the first person to put it together? Because I'm pretty you sure... You were probably one of about five people that <laughs> figured that, that connection out. <laughs> But those Seriously. people that do figure it out, don't ever let me forget it. <laughs> and now it's out there. Now everyone's going to have to let you know. It's now out there to... Oh, yeah. So what was you in the police? Let's, 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 let's dial it back to the police. So what was, you, what was your roles? And... So my role, I was, I was in Sussex, we call them NRT officers, so Neighbourhood Response Officer. Um, so basically, if you dialed 999, be lucky if you <laughs> turn up, save the day. Uh, so I kind of, I did that and I was, uh, an amber permit holder. So, uh, blue lights and suits and stuff like that. Um, and then I was a taser officer as well. So I got to, to carry that. Did you have to take a taser to then use a taser? Cause they in class, sometimes they get someone to take one, don't they? Say that again. Did you, did you have to take a taser during training? Cause sometimes they are. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what? You had that option and I, I wasn't that stupid. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I've, uh, yeah, they are, they're pretty effective. Shall we say? And then, and then I know it's put like a, a generic interviewee question, but do you think that the, the things and the lessons that you learned at the police gave you any sort of grounded in what you do in property? A hundred percent. What, what I think you find as a police officer, is obviously you know a lot of other police officers, right? And that's who you spend a lot of your time with. And I don't think police officers themselves actually realize how many uh, transferable skills that you pick up when leaving the police or looking to do something else. Yep. Maybe a few people would think, oh, well, I don't really know how to do anything else. Police officers know how would be able to transfer those skills to do a lot of stuff. And, and I think the reason a lot of people don't realize that is because everyone else can do it as well. So when you've got to negotiate with someone or communicate with someone, a lot of police officers are very good communicators because yeah. they're to it all the time. In but extreme when situations. You, communicate, you don't stand out, right? So you don't, maybe don't think that you are. Um, so I found when I left, there was a lot of skills that, that I was able to, to take with me. So things like negotiation, communication, influencing people um not as in like social media influencer yeah. influencing a scenario to go the way you you might want it to go uh for the best outcome stuff like that brilliant nice <laughs> so guys all right so um and then also during the police you had your karate um dojo scenario so what was, what was that all about yeah so um that was one of the franchises so i had a, a few martial arts schools um, so I've done martial arts since I was little. My dad taught me uh, and he had, a, he had a school or has a school. And then um, we kind of built that up. We had three schools, um, but it got to a stage where you've got to make certain choices in life of, of what you can continue and things like that. So now we just have one. Um, so I, I passed on two of the schools that I had to, to, to others who were, who were, black belts within the school, really, really good kind of instructors and yeah. leaders and stuff. So they're kind of carrying that mantle. And it's kind of a tradition in the martial arts to, to pass schools on like that. But what was really, really good about those is, is because I had them for so many years, I was, I was living off my police wage. Yep. That was my living income, paying my bills and, and all of that sort of stuff. Excuse me. And then my business income was my play money as such, or a good friend of mine refers to them as fun tokens. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that description of money, fun tokens, because that is exactly <laughs> what it is. And, um, and what I would do is that the profit made from that business is what I would use to then buy property with. So that's another way that I, I built my portfolio was, was reinvesting that, that income from business because I knew that's, that's where ultimately the long-term strategy was for, for building wealth and building income. And it's, that's a good lesson it's as well. You can only make money from a business as long as you're doing it, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And like I say, it's a good lesson for a lot of people that are sort of thinking, how do I get into property? Or they're stuck in jobs where they're not particularly happy and thinking, how do I get out of this? But the money's good, or you're getting that sort of a little bit of an employment trap. 
and to be able to have like again side hustle I, I don't really like the term side hustle because it doesn't doesn't give it enough respect for how hard it is because a side yeah, hustle is like what you mean do where actually I think a side hustle is probably harder than your actual employed job because you're learning on your feet you're tired you're doing everything you can around the outside of what you're doing but something like a side hustle can enable you to do future plans and gives you those like that goal setting um, mindset to think right what I want to do forward I want something better for my life and, exactly. um, yeah. and obviously what, 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 and, and this is it this is it going in terms of like you know doing something better for your life and, and, and maybe getting you out of a job you're not too happy about and things like that don't get me wrong when I when I joined the police I loved it you know I really wanted to help people and I, I love the people that I work with I, I still miss them a lot um, and but it got to a stage where I didn't enjoy the job I was doing anymore. Um, it was very, very stressful. And, you know, the, the types of people that you're dealing with all the time puts a, a skew on, on reality and humanity and, and how you look at people. Yeah. I, I, it's funny you say, in, in the uh, nicest way, you basically end up thinking everyone is a knobhead. Yeah, well, a good close friend of mine's uh, he's old Bill over in Brighton, and he said that exact same thing. He said he'd come home and his wife was the person that would bring him back to reality. Because if you're just dealing with some of the worst people in society, day in, day out, day in, day out, your 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 human experience is just negative. So you think the world is just all criminals, and then it takes that grounding of trying to think. Actually, no, the world is a bigger place, and there are nice people out there, and and that's what. Oh, I totally agree. I totally agree. And, and so having that side hustle, as you called it, and the property that I'd been building kind of as a hobby actually got me to a stage where it was my way out of that job. Yeah. So if I didn't have those things, I wouldn't have had really had a choice. I'd have probably thought, I don't know anything else. I've got to, pay. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And, and the thing is, once you build yourself to a level of income in terms of the bandings, you know, on how many years you've been there to, to walk away from a, a you know, circa 38, 39, 40,000 pound a year income to something else to, to try and walk into something equivalent can be quite, quite hard. Definitely. And that, that's probably where we met as well, wasn't it? It was that intersection of you coming out of your time at the police force and your time of thinking, actually, I'm going to do property full time. So I want, to know, I want to know a little bit more about what gave you the confidence to say, this is now me, Do you know, and the, the, the police forces, police forces, my past and property is my future. So where, how did you build that confidence in yourself? Um, well, I built the, uh, the built, the business was good. The business was good. That was, that helped give me confidence that I was going to be okay. Such the, the property income was good as well. And I, I had a, a half decent kind of amount of properties at that time. Um, enough to kind of make sure that, you know, I all of the bills and, and not have to worry too much i wouldn't have been able to sit around and do absolutely nothing all day but you know um who wants to do that and that, that's another story because that, <laughs> to be fair, that is what i did for a little while and we've had that conversation but it gets very boring very quickly so um i don't know what i was doing i think you had just opened your first office in the town yeah, so it's the first high street office. So the, the the firm had been running well from two thousand and one, but I took I'd taken it over maybe three years before we'd met, and then it was the first high street office. And you were the first person to walk through the door. Yeah, because I I think at the at the at that point I lived around the corner and yeah. I was in the high street for something. I was probably going to Tesco's or something. Saw your signs going up. Thought I'll pop my head in and say hello. So I don't think you even open at that point. I think no, it wasn't. No, no, no. All that stuff like that. Yeah head in had a chat with you guys because there's a few of you in there and then ended up coming back to you guys for the first deal that i did which was very soon after i popped my head in probably within about a month yeah. six weeks maybe um i found uh found the next property deal um and we did that using bridging yeah and that was kind of i guess i i think that was probably my intro to bridging that first yeah. deal i did with you guys yeah and so that opened my eyes to all of the power of that and, and how quick you can, you can do that sort of stuff. So that, that deal was a, a fantastic deal. So that one was, um, that was a one bed flat and it was valued at 120 pre-purchase. 
um, but I was getting it for 90. And <laughs> <home way>. <laughs> <laughs> what we were able to do, because we, we had a lender that was so good that we were using on that one. And, and you know, I, I still use that lender today because they are an awesome lender and, uh, and they get it. They get property people, right? So, um, yeah, sorry. So value 120, purchase price 90, gross bridging loan 96K. I remember these figures. I know this is <laughs> four years ago, but I, I remember. Rain <laughs> yeah, rain bad, yeah. So gross, gross bridge was 96. I think it was over 12 months. And it, so the net was about 81, 82, 83K, which meant, you know, to buy a property instead of needing a 25% deposit, I needed like just under 10%. Yeah. And that's a buy to let property, right? So that, that was cool. I was like, yeah, this is awesome. And then got in there, did it up. And eight weeks later, we got it revalued at, at 140. So we ended up taking a 75% loan to value on that at 105. And I basically got all my money back within about three months. There may have been a few thousand pounds tied up. But yeah. how, like, that might not sound like much, but there was a lot of awesome things at play in that deal that I don't know if we've got time to go into now or not, but to, to be able to buy a property in the Southeast, right? Where you make say 35,000 pounds on paper in equity, you know, you're going to have a few hundred pounds a month net profit and it's cost you between nothing and a few thousand pounds to do it. Ultimately that's like, Elf level magic, <laughs> especially in the it, it, that's that that's like next level. So that's the gold standard, right? And and the thing is, that the caveat on what I've just said is is that is the gold standard. Those deals aren't out there everywhere, and they're not you know you're not falling over these deals left, right, and centre, especially at the moment. Um, but they are out there, and they can be done in the southeast. People, people think, oh, I can't be down in the southeast. You've got to go up north. You've got to go up north. And to be honest, I shouldn't. But when people say, I say, yeah, you've got to go up north. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't look around here. Don't look around here. No, no, no. I mean, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be amiss if I didn't ask, because I, I know a lot of listeners are going to listen to that story and go, well, how? Because I want to do that. So anyway, if, we, if we dial it right back, so how, how did you find that deal? How did you know what the numbers were? How did you construct it? Where were the relationships? So give us some sort of the early stages of how you would have actually achieved that deal. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I, I, I actually saw this deal. I saw this deal on right move and it was on at, I think it was on at offers over 120 offers over 125, something like that. And it was an auction purchase. Okay. So it was going to the room and I called up about it. And basically the agent said, we've had about 40 viewings on it, 40 or 50 viewings. You'll have to forgive me because I can't. Well, that's a nice little bit. <laughs> yeah. So 40, 40 to 50 viewings on it. And about 30 people had requested the legal pack. Right. And I knew why, because I knew it was a good deal. And it was a good location, good flat. There was scope to, to add value, etc. However... I thought to myself, there is just, there's just too much heat on this property. There's too much competition. And trying to get yourself all set up with everything, I, if I'm honest, I just couldn't be bothered. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, it was, sometimes you know when, look, you're not really got a try. It's probably going to go for too much money and you don't want to put yourself in a position to, to make a bit of an error or anything like that. So I left it. And anyway, the day of the auction comes, and, uh, and I got a call from the estate agent. And this comes back to your relationships. So, I mean, for me, you will probably hear me say this. Well, you, you've heard me say it before. Yeah. But I'll say it time and time again. Relationships is everything. And everything is your relationships. So the deals you get, the deals you do, you know, um, the jobs, everything is going to be based on, you, on your relationships. And what I found as I've kind of got a bit older and I hope wiser is that I would much rather have an awesome, less lucrative or completely unlucrative relationship than, than 
have a relationship where I'm making money and I hate every second of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I really would. I, and this is, you know, some people might say, oh, you, you know, you're bullshitting or whatever. But if I was going to make a hundred thousand pounds with person A and laugh and love it and it was awesome fun, I would much rather do that with someone I kind of know, like, and trust than make a million quid with someone I don't know who they are. And it's just a painful soul destroying. Well, ultimately, like experience will tell you that that hundred grand is easier to make than the million. And more often than not, that million will never come because like you said, those relationships, if you can't work with someone or you're not enjoying working with someone, it, it's, it's a sign from the gods, isn't it? it? It does just let you know. And if you feel uncomfortable, yeah, and, and I, used, I know we keep going off on a tangent, but I used to push through that. I thought, I've got to push through it. You know, things that, you know, life is hard, da 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 And, and I'd, I'd stick around in relationships um, longer than I should, whether it be friendships or business or work or, or, or whatever. Uh, now, now, I'm, I'm happy to say I'm absolutely ruthless with my time and my relationships. So if someone wastes my time um, or doesn't kind of respect my time, and I'm not talking about getting paid for my time, yeah. that's not what it is, but, but my time is now my currency. And that's a whole nother concept. You know, we could do a whole hour on, on that, I guess, is that, you know, for most people, currency is currency. But you get to a stage, whether it be in kind of your income or where you're at in life or spirituality or your mentality or mindset where, you know, time becomes your currency. And it's, well, you know, what am I getting for my time? How, how am I using my time? Am I, am I spending it? Am I investing it or am I wasting it? Those are your three options. With, <laughs> okay. So right now I'm choosing to spend my time with you. You sure it's not wasted? Well, you are? <laughs> wasted. You're not wasted. Could be wasted. I was going to say, that you're probably, that's probably better ways of spending your morning than looking at my mind. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so those, that's a really important concept for anyone listening because you can spend your time, you can invest your time, or you can waste it. Okay? But it's yours. Do what you want with it. And it's the yeah. ultimate currency, isn't it? Yeah. But like, you watch that. You watch that. Uh, don't let anyone else decide what you're going to do with it. Yeah. Have you watched that film that... Uh, I want to call it just in time, but that ain't it. It's, it's Justin Timberlake, but you know, one where he's got the time limit on. Yeah, his I think it's called time, isn't it? Or yeah, called something like that. But that, as a metaphor for life, is is phenomenal. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and it, it, sometimes you forget that people are listening and might not have seen that film. So essentially, Justin Timberlake has a little clock on his on his forearm, and it and it's a countdown to when you're going to die. So there is no money, but you you use time. So if you're going to buy a cup of coffee, you put your arm against this thing and it takes some time off of you. And then if you do start, you work, you get a bit more time. And then there's all these rich people that have got all the time in the world. And, and then like, and the, the best scene from that one, I go, we're talking about films in a property podcast, but the best thing <laughs> that that's always stuck with me is when he, there are, it's not a spoiler, but um, Justin Timberlake gets into one of the other sections where the rich people live and they're all eating really, really slowly. Cause it doesn't matter because they've got all the time in the world and he's eating really fast because for him, that's a that's a process that he needs to get through to go and do something else because he's gonna he potentially could die soon. But the, when you go back to time and value in it, is is finding those parts of your life that you think right, I'm gonna and add time to that, I'm gonna take time away from that, um, which actually does in a roundabout way. Again, another question I was gonna ask you, which again going on a bit of a tangent before we come back to property, is like health and fitness. So I know that you're on a bit of a journey at the moment. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? So again, you've decided to portion some of your time for yourself for your health and fitness yeah so in long story short i got fat <laughs> <laughs> you'd gone from kung fu master to, <laughs> to kung pao chi <laughs> yeah kung fu panda more like <laughs> yeah so um to be honest like weight has always kind of been a thing for me my weight's always gone kind of up and down Probably slightly more up. I'm I'm a little bit more stocky, and but I'm short. Um, Are you? I never, I never know. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually on a booster seat, right? <laughs> Are you can see me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so basically, uh, yeah, I um, I got first lockdown. I put a lot of weight on. Put a lot of weight on. 
I actually had a small operation and then, and then I couldn't, couldn't really do anything anyway, but, um, lockdown just, pff, I was just there. The fridge was just calling me. Yeah. Like, Rob, come get a snack, you know? So yeah, so I, I got very, very fat and, uh, and decided I, look, I needed to do something about it. So I've actually, I've got a friend, a really good friend of mine. Um, James, his name is, and, uh, and he's into health and fitness and, and he kind of uses these Herbalife products and writes meal plans and all that sort of stuff. So I went to see him. He put me on a program. It's awesome. I've, <laughs> so far, I think I've been doing it 22 days. I've lost something like 10, 12 pounds. Oh, well done, mate. That's brilliant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but for me, again, <laughs> you've got to know your strengths and weaknesses. So for instance, whether it be property or finance or work or, or health, know your strengths and weaknesses and don't shy away from your weaknesses. Just accept them. Yeah. Say, okay, so I know I'm weak here. So what am I going to do about it? You just deny a weakness, then you're not going to help yourself. So I knew one of my weaknesses was getting hungry. So if you said to me right now, so I, I'm, I'm not hungry right now. So if you said, look, do you want a McDonald's breakfast? I'd be like, no, no, I'm okay. But within about three seconds of getting, <laughs> I'm going to bite your arm off from McDonald's breakfast. So I said this to him. And so he wrote my program with my meals and my shakes, et cetera, and my snacks that doesn't allow me to get hungry. In fact, like he's done it in a way where I, I'm actually struggling to get all of the, the calories in that I need to get. I'm eating so much and I'm still coming in under That's yeah. why I'm losing weight, but he's made it easy. Um, so the shakes, I just make them, it's 30 seconds, frozen fruit, all of that sort of stuff, extra protein, it's all good. And then the meals, and I told you about these actually. Yeah, game changer. From Muscle Food, again, there's like 30 different meals on there that are pre-made, pre-prepped, and they all taste awesome. And yeah. it's, well, I, it takes a thinking out of it. You know? well, me, me and my girlfriend, so after I saw on Facebook that you was doing the muscle foods, because my girlfriend does um, uh, like t-shirt printing and gifts and, and all those sort of things, but she does, she sells them not on the high street. I'll give her a little plug, precious little plum. Um, but but Christmas and, and Father's Day are, are two mega, mega sort of seasons, as you can imagine. So So we were looking at different ways to sort of automate our lives is probably a nice generic statement and when i saw the muscle foods i was like i because i'm training i'm, I'm doing a, a very, like a, a program myself like exercise program but but diet has always been a trouble for me so i've, I've always been in okay shape but i've never been in great shape and it's always to do with diet and i eat okay but not great it's always a very middle of the road very high carb but not like not junk food so it's sort of a lot of pastas and lasagnas and very italian but never really uh, took off so then we said right we'll do this muscle food but mainly because it takes that decision making out of our day so again if we and i can bring this back into meaning from business point of view is we've we've reduced the amount of decisions that we make in a day making other decisions easier to make because you've not got like that decision fatigue so when i wake up in the morning i've got a meal plan on my fridge say right i'm having the maple pancakes this morning or the fuel 10k this morning and for lunch i know exactly what i've got and the whole week's all done and then we get in the evening. How how many people out there sits there at six o'clock at night and goes, right, what are we having for dinner tonight? Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and, and then, and then it takes you half an hour to decide it's going to take 45 minutes to cook it. Let's just yeah. get it. Yeah. yeah that, and that, you are exactly right. So by just re removing that and then to bring that back into business, that's almost like outsourcing food. You know, we've outsourced that decision making of, of eating and, and that part of our health and fitness. Um, and, and an analogy I always use is life is like the like spinning plates is you can't all your all your plates will never spin perfectly at all times because you will, if you're focusing on something something else will let go and you've just got to keep running around spinning these plates trying to find what's what's what needs fixing and what you've done with your exercise and your health if you've gone that plate has fallen off let's get it going let's give it a good spin and then we can then go and and do everything else well, this, this this is what i said to my mate i mean the thing is you and i both know and there'll be people listening who are into their health and fitness that are anti this or anti that or pro this or pro that. So you can do all of this with food or you can do all of this with that. And yeah, I get that. And I agree. You can do everything just with food. Yeah. The thing is, I ain't gonna fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I know I'm not. If you told me I had to prep every Sunday for five hours, yeah, and then, you know, I had to eat five times a day meals that I've had to make, I'm just not going to bother. Yeah. For me, it was about, I said, I said to my friend, look, make it easy he said 
he said he said something like <clears throat> could you could you make yourself one snack a day and a snack might be like almonds or some cheese or some boiled eggs or something like could you do that I said well yeah i can do that I'm not that <laughs> <laughs> he said fine so so your meal plan is like a shake tea and aloe snack muscle food meal um snack or shake again and then a muscle food meal so it's five meals a day and i've only ever got to think about one of them yep and boiled eggs you know you're getting on with the boiled eggs you, you have to get a delia smith proteiny type snack you have to get the delia smith cookbook to learn how to boil an egg <laughs> you, know, well, you know what i bought this little well i didn't even buy it um my other half bought this little um egg, egg timer boiler thingamabob um and it's awesome. Put these little <laughs> through a little hole at the top. Eight minutes later, I tell you, there, there are tangents, and then there's going from talking about property. It is rabbit holes. Of the that's that's pretty good. Going. <laughs> what we do is we're spinning back round. So, okay, so we, we're going we, back we to we were we were on relationships. We had yeah. About how did I get that deal? So I went. I started with relationships, and yeah. here's the thing. So this deal goes to auction, right? Now, just to recap, forty to fifty people looked at it. Thirty people requested the legal pack. It goes to auction now this this property in itself was in eastbourne um but the auction was in something like southampton so the auction happens next day at like 8 30 in the morning some ridiculous time of the morning that i don't know exists uh the agent called me you all right rob how you doing yeah good um you know that property that you're interested in it's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're never gonna guess what. Well, what? It it didn't sell. So what do you mean it didn't sell? <laughs> no one bid. Do you know what I think happened? I think exactly what I spoke about earlier happened. The other 30, 40, 50 people, when there's 30, 40, 50 people looking at this, so I'm not gonna bother. Couple that with the fact that the auction was out of town down in Southampton and, and people couldn't be bothered to go. Um, and it just slipped through the net. So Sorry, he's... Just, just on that, just, just, we'll, we'll carry on. But dude, is that a trick to an extent? Is that a lesson for people to learn that auctions outside of the town that the property is, are they going to have less people attending to purchase places outside of town? So if you went to an auction in Brighton, is the chances are no one's bidding on properties in Leeds. If you're in Leeds, chances are no one's bidding on properties in Brighton. Is that a thing? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to it, but I would say there's, there's got to be something there because let's say, I mean, I, was, I, I wasn't going to go to Southampton. It's not I far away. <laughs> you know, the telephone and stuff, but I wasn't getting the car to go to Southampton. So, you know, uh, I guess so. I guess you could be right. But the, the thing is, in terms of the relationships, I'd worked hard to build a relationship with the agent. So when it, you know, his job is to sell it, right? So when it didn't sell, he gave me a call. Are you still interested? Do you want it? There's 50 other people he could have called first. Yeah, yeah, and that's the, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, but he called me because I'd worked on that. He knew, liked, and trusted me. And he knows I'm not a bullshitter. He knew that if I said, I'm going to have it, let's get it done, let's get it bought, I'm not going to mess him around. That property would get bought. Yeah. So I think the first thing I did is I said, look, I need an hour to put the finance in place gave you guys a call i think about half an hour after that we had the the terms and about half hour or two after that i went and just went into the thing and put the deposit down so that the relationships i had got me that deal yeah so imagine if someone said to you all you got to do is come up with nine ish grand and then three months later, I'm going to give it back to you. You know, and you're going to have a property with 35 grand of equity, a couple of hundred pound a month forever. And it's going to double in value every 10 to 12 years. Um, and it's only ever going to cost you actually a couple of thousand pounds yep. back end. You do that all day long. But I, I got that because I'd invested my time in building a relationship with someone. Yeah massively and then and then where 
where did you get your knowledge from? So obviously you were starting to build a bit of a hobbyist, as it were, landlord portfolio, but looking into things like bridging loans or spotting deals like you spotted, where, where did you, was it through experience or? Um, so it was a little bit, a little bit of both. So um, I, I, my, my, one of my first ever proper girlfriends, her dad was a, a, a property investor. Um, and had a very large portfolio and he'd done really, really well for himself. Um, and my understanding is he'd done it years and years ago where you would, you know, buy one property, do it up and sell it. And you'd make enough to then go and buy two. Yep. Do them up, sell it. You'd then make enough to go and buy four and you'd remortgage and do things like that. So this person ended up with, with very, very big portfolio and, and ultimately no lending against it, which is, you know, the holy grail yeah yeah absolutely risk-free um but now things are a lot more expensive it's a little bit more more difficult but that's what piqued my interest in property um you know and he'd, he'd kind of have chats with me and, and give me a bit of advice here and there and, and and things like that and um but it was all kind of from from his point of view of what he had done yeah because that's that's what he knew right <laughs> Um, so then I was, as I said, I, I bought a couple of properties as, as, you know, the hobbies and things like that. And, and I think I was about five or six years in, maybe, maybe six or seven. And, and I might have had, you know, four or five properties, something like that. And it was weird. I, I remember, I remember walking down the street. I don't know what I was doing, but I just remember walking down the street and I was thinking to myself, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much one, the only friend from my friend's circle that didn't go to university i went i went straight to work um so i didn't have any of that uni debt yep i've been earning money for a few years um and i had property and i still kind of had to work yeah financially free as people say and I, I i was like i don't get it what am i doing wrong surely this should be easier by now you know I should be a multi quadrillionaire already. <laughs> you know, I've got like five properties. What's going on? Yeah. Um, and so that prompted me to, to kind of Google property training. And so um, I actually ended up, I ended up in one of these sales funnels before I knew what a sales funnel was. Yeah. Uh, where you go to kind of a two hour free thing. Um. And then they upsell you to a weekend course. And then at the weekend course, they upsell you to uh, a longer course. Now, I kid you not, kid you not, considering I was into property, yeah. I had a few properties. I had kind, kind of a mentor in the background who knew about property and had a portfolio himself. Um, and, you know, I was reading all these books, which dad pulled out, et cetera. I kid you not, I went to this thing and I learned more about property investing in two hours and the concepts that were possible. And this is really important concept. Yeah. You just need to know exactly how something is done all the time. You just need to know that it can be done. Then you find someone that knows how to do it. Yep. Um, I, yeah, I learned more in that two hours than I had doing property in the past five, six, seven years. Because that's because because a lot of these courses get a bad rap, don't they? So, so yeah, they do. We, we, so obviously from the previous season of, of the property investors podcast, we never sold courses. We we're not in it to sell some sort of scheme or upsell or pretend we're some sort of property guru. Ours come from a genuine interest in the market and, and our own experiences. And then I think over the last 18 months, I think property courses have probably become more prevalent. I think fake gurus have become more prevalent. So since, since we left, since we recorded the last one to where we recorded now, I think, the property courses have probably taken a different turn. So what, what, what year did you start on your education? Um, I want to say, I, I want to say 2017. Yeah. So what was it like three, three, four years ago sort of thing? Yeah. I think it was around the August, September of 2017. I went to one of these two hour free things, right? <laughs> and at the end of it, they did this deal where it was a thousand pounds for the three day weekend. I mean, the thing is, is yes, that it was a sales pitch, yep. but equally it was undeniable what I had learned in those two hours. Yep. And I knew I'd be an absolute moron not to do it. But yep. they 
um, they did uh, they did um, a deal where it was yes a thousand pounds for the weekend, but you can actually take two of you. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, each, yeah. Right? So after that, I called two people. Well, not after. I mean, after the presentation, but whilst yeah. I was there about to pay, I mean, I, I'd have paid a thousand pounds for myself. Um, but I called two friends, called two really, really good friends. And um, one of them, one of them bless him, is actually a joint venture partner now, um, you know, three or four years later. So called one of them and uh, said, uh, it's 500 quid. This is the deal. This, this is what I've done. You know what I've done. You know how I, into it I am. And I'm telling you as your friend, we need to do this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a scam. <laughs> You're gonna lose your money. It's bullshit. Blah 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 blah. Okay, don't worry about it. Call the other person. How much do you want? What's the bank account details? I'll send you the money right now. Like no questions asked. Yeah. So that person came on the course on the weekend course with me, and then that person ended up signing up to the to the two two year course with me. Yes. Yeah. So uh, on that we learn uh, you know different courses do it differently so some will be kind of a year two years and um they will teach you everything so this one for instance you went on a three-day course where they would teach you a little bit about everything so you got a broad knowledge yep then you would do kind of specialty courses where you'd come back for three days at a time on just one subject so you might do three days on creative, creatively financing deals, right? Or you might do three days on lease options or three days on commercial to residential conversions, whatever. Okay, so that's kind of how they did it. Um, other courses might do, instead of doing like a two-year thing, they might just do a weekend thing, and, but you're just paying for one subject. Yeah. Just to learn one subject. So you might go on a course and for a weekend, you might pay, you know... 1997 or 2997 and uh and just learn deal packaging yeah because that's because that is the thing isn't it is but because again going back to the property investors podcast we talk more than just property because we we genuinely believe that it's it's a business it's an industry in itself and and like we, we've had previous episodes where we've had architects on we've had branding consultants on you know we've had chief executives of, te- of of prop tech companies it's more than just buying and selling or buying and renovating property there is this whole ecosystem that sits around being a business person um and then i think that that, that leads me on to where i want to sort of one sort of steer the conversation now is the where you have got so many choices when you when you sort of come out of that course where did you see yourself what were the things that excited you that you said actually that's that's the thing that I want to do, or is there a couple of things that you wanted to do? What, what was when you come out of that course? So, so we dial it back and say, right, I've got my knowledge now. Where do I want? Where do I want my career to go? Because then later I'm going to ask you, where are you now? So if we can build ourselves up to that point. Yeah. So, so for instance, for me, it was a case of I was quite lucky going into the course, the, the first course I did because I've I've done more than one company's training course, and that's why I kind of, I know a little bit about how the different people operate. Um, I came out, uh, sorry, I went in probably with, with more knowledge than most people that had gone in because obviously they're, they're bringing people in that have absolutely no property experience at all who want to get into it. So, so again, for me, it was the concepts that I learned. Yeah. The concepts of learning will actually, you know, um, you can borrow money from an angel for six months or nine months or 12 months. You can borrow money from people for the refurb. So, you know, you might have the deposit, but not the refurb money. So most people will go, well, I've got the deposit, but I haven't got the refurb, so I can't do the deal. Well, you can, you've just got to do it creatively. Um, the, the concepts of bridging, so buying a property that's in a, crap state on bridging, doing it up and very quickly refinancing it and getting your money back. So the concept to me there was, well, buying property the way I have bought it, I'm buying something, I'm sitting on it for two or three years, then I'm getting my money back and then I'm able to buy another one. Using bridging and buying the right types of property in the right way 
instead of doing that in two or three years, I'm doing it in two or three months. So how many more of those deals can I do in the time that it was going to, I would normally do it in the two or three years. Well, every few months, if the deals are there. So, so for me, it was, it was learning concepts of the more creative and, and higher level stuff that's out there and available to do. Um, and then also just making me more effective as an investor, you know, um, and, and don't get me wrong. There are people that have been scammed in courses. Um, I don't doubt that for a second. I've seen the stuff on Facebook. So it's horrendous. Um, but you know, there are people that are going to be successful at stuff and not successful at stuff. Having been in the same room and learned the same stuff, that is life. And I'm not talking about the people that have legitimately been scammed out of their money. I'm talking about, you know, you will get people who go on courses. You know, I could have gone on these courses and gone, oh, that's nice. And then just carried on doing what I'm doing. And I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am now. Yeah. Um, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But a, a lot of people get... Um... <sighs> trying to think of the word but they they get caught up in the education and i don't want to say choke because it's not uh, it's not appropriate but they can find themselves studying for studying's sake and, junkies yeah that's it yeah and, and they feel like they're progressing in their life because they know more than they did yesterday which is fantastic but until you're putting your practice into practice you're you're just studying you're a student there's a difference between being a student I think I, I, and again i think that's a mindset thing now you know just having a conversation, you and me, and, and what people listening have hopefully realised is that it's just our opinion. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It doesn't mean we're wrong. It's just our thoughts on a matter. Yep. And that's the great thing about kind of chatting like this with someone like you. You, you, can, you can say what you're thinking and, and explain it as well. And, and the thing is, you've got people that will study. And like you said, you know, they think they're progressing. They think they're learning. But bless them, they're never going to buy a damn property in their life. They're not going to do it. They're not going to pull the trigger. But that is not a money thing or an education thing. It's a hundred percent a mindset thing. Yeah, no, I that, is, that is they've got a subconscious fear of getting it wrong, even though they know they're right. And that, and that, that must be so tough because I think me and you, we're not. We're, I'd, I'd say we're risk takers to an extent. Do you know, what I mean, I think we we enjoy the deal. We enjoy doing stuff. And 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 and, it, and I can't. I can only empathise of what it must be like to have that, not have that confidence in yourself to push yourself to that next step. I think me personally, I think a lot of my confidence comes from my family. I think my dad's an entrepreneur. My mum's an entrepreneur. Um, I, my brother's an actor. Everyone, everyone's a go-getter, and we've never really, as a family, had that issue of putting ourselves out there or putting ourselves on the line to go and improve our lives. Did you think that your your confidence has come from your family and your background of where, where you've got to the point where you feel confident to make those deals? Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was quite fortunate being brought up doing martial arts, you know, when I was, you know, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, 13, those periods where, you know, you're building your confidence in terms of, you know, leadership skills or communication or leading things. Yeah. Um, I was shoved out the front of kids' classes to, to kind of, my dad used to do this thing where once you got a brown belt, he'd, he'd give you tiny snippets of the class to lead. Yeah. Right, so he'd still be there and he'd be running the class, but he'd say, right, you know, Tom, you're going to go out the front for the next four minutes and you're going to run the kicking drills for the rest of the class. When you're 10 or 11 or 12 and you've got a load of other kids that you're, you're now in charge of a group of people, you're running a class. So you're running people, you're commanding people, you're controlling people, a group, right? And you do that on a weekly basis, snippets here, snippets there. Um, and then and build that up over three, four, five years. You end up being able to, to lead or manage and, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's where I got my confidence from. 
No, amazing. I think that pretty much brings us round circle to sort of today. So I think a really good idea of, of how you've got to today, the, the life experiences you had. So what's going on at the moment? So what deals have you got going on? What's, what's your projects on the boil? What's... So, so yes, yeah, so I've done a couple of cool projects lately. So um, probably if I say like maybe in the past couple of years, 18 months, couple of years, because not much has happened this year. <laughs> um, so past couple of years, I bought, I bought a one bed flat um for ninety two thousand, um and then what i did is i bought that on bridging so and actually i don't know if i told you this story or not i got that property for less money than i offered on it <laughs> i knew you could do that <laughs> that's like one of those that's like one of those, like, those, like, those, those cards well, i'll give you a tenner <laughs> and i'll give you nine i'll give you eight i'll give you seven <laughs> so, i basically i actually i i i it was on quite high on the market. I think it was offers over 115, but I went in at about 86 because it needed a lot of work. Um, and it ended up going backwards and forwards. And I was at 92 and I put my offer in of 92 via email. And then uh, the agent came back and said, no, it's been rejected. So I left it a day or two. And then I put in an offer of 93,750. Okay. And what happened was, Fortuitously, you know when you write an email and then you get distracted and for whatever <laughs> press send and it goes into your drafts. Yeah, that happened to the agent. So I put ninety three seven fifty in, and the agent didn't forward that to the seller. She wrote it all up, but just didn't press the send button for whatever reason. Something must have happened in the office. Whatever. Anyway, because the seller then thought he hadn't heard from me and I hadn't up my offer, I came back as well, and then I'll take it, I'll have 92. <laughs> so I got that, which is great. Um, and I, I did that up again. That was bridging, did it up, switched it over to a buy-to-let mortgage and got that revalued at 150. Um, so I took 120 and I think I'd spent about 115 altogether, including fees and all of that. So I, I actually, and again, that's in the Southeast, we got paid five, about five thousand pounds to buy it. Um, you know, thirty thousand or in equity and a few hundred pounds a month. And then what happened was, people, you know, this is opportunities are everywhere, right? So when I bought that property, I had to sort out the insurance. It meant I had to track down the person downstairs because it was a house that was two flats. I had to track down the other owner to sort out the buildings insurance for the bridging company. And whilst I was there, I said, look, you know, do you want to sell me the flat? It was a bit of a crappy flat as well. And uh, he said, well, if the, if the number's right, yeah. So I said, well, I'm getting this one for 92. And he wanted something like 115 or, or something easy, right? And so we went up and down, up and down. And we, I got him down, I think, to about 108 at the time. But it just, it, it didn't work. I left it at the time I left it. So... Here's the thing. Talk about the fortune is in the follow-up. I don't know if you've heard that before. No, I've never heard that before, no. The fortune is in the follow-up. So I don't just forget about these things. I know there's a deal there. You don't just kind of go, oh, it didn't work out. I'm going to look at that. That goes in a little reminder somewhere, you know, in the back of your head to, to, to sort out. So guess what happens? Exactly one year later, it's time to renew the insurance. Ask again. <laughs> I've got to renew the insurance I'm happy to deal with it all can you just send me half the money yeah oh by the way whilst I've got you last year we were at about 108 on, on selling that flat I've got a little bit of extra fun but not too much you know what can you do so I ended up getting it for 105 brilliant now I usually at this you've got to know your numbers right so I know my numbers in my area and for a one bed, you want to pay 90,000. If you're using bridging, you want to pay 90,000, maybe 92, 93 to buy it, do it up, switch it onto a buy to let and get, get most of your money back out. That's, that's the numbers. You, you might say, well, why'd you pay 105? Because I was able to turn it into a two bed. So I took that one from a one bed, turned it into a two bed, and then got it revalued at 175. Wow. Took 75% of that and that was a recent one we that one i i this is where i like kind of deals where there's a lot in it because covid prevented us getting off of that bridge right 
So being on the bridge for however long extra it was probably cost about six or seven thousand pounds more than it should have done. Yeah, yeah. I haven't lost six or seven thousand. It's just six or seven thousand extra that's left in that deal, which yeah. is annoying. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, these things happen. But imagine if that deal was really, really tight. That could have put it the wrong way, which is what you never want to happen. Yeah. Make sure your deal's good and there's enough kind of meat in that deal that if if something like COVID happens, doesn't doesn't matter too much. So that that's another one. So now what's great about that is I have the whole building, two flats that I've I've picked up for what's that, 197. And the building's now worth valued at 325, which is great. Um, and then so there's that one. Um, I did uh, I did a two bed house into a five bed HMO about 18 months ago. Yep. Just in the video, the vi- the, it looks so good. You've done such a good job on oh, it. Oh, the video. Yeah. So if you check out my Facebook, like scroll back through my Facebook. Actually, that's the most recent one. I haven't come on to that one yet. So that's the next door. So I've, well, okay. So story here, right? Like another little learning here is, um, I call them the yellow house and the blue house because that's what color they were. <laughs> <laughs> the yellow house and the blue house. So I actually went to see the yellow house. Okay, that was on the market, all right? Um, and I was walking around and it's, you know, again, if you go back through my Facebook profile or my LinkedIn, you'll see the before videos. I mean, it was really, really bad. And I got my offer accepted. Now, here's the thing. My, my offer was not the highest offer on that property, but I had a relationship with the agent yep. in a way where they knew I would not mess around. Whatever the stats are on sales falling through, you know, they know that won't happen with me. If I say I'm going to buy it, bar before exchange the house burning down, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy it. Yeah. Unless the only caveat on that is unless I've put in there, look, it's subject to. Yeah, of course. Planning or making sure I can get five rooms. So I'm not quite sure I need to get an architect in. But at the but, same time, you've been up front before you've started yeah, that. So the conversation is, yeah. There's no point in wasting, like, I don't like people wasting my time. No. I'm not going to waste theirs as much as I can help it, right? So you, anyway, get, you get a lot of people that keep secrets as well, don't you? They, they, they look at a deal and they think, well, I won't mention that or I will keep this behind. But sometimes if you put all your cards on the table and say, look, this is the plan, this is what I want, these are the numbers. Yeah, you'll people be respected for it. That, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, so I went to look at the yellow house, right? And, um, and I, I looked out of the back window and the, I, it was like Jumanji. The garden was like Jumanji. But again, you know, there was a lot of people looking around there. 20, 30, I mean, there was 20 people there whilst I was there. And um, so I looked around and, and I noticed that next door's garden was the same, completely overgrown. So I went, I wonder what that means. So I left. And, um, and I came back when everyone was gone because I didn't want people seeing me knock next door. So what I'd, I like to do is I like to knock on the houses next door, um, A, to ask what it's like to live in the area, what the street's like, et cetera. A lot of the time I know, but I want to hear it from someone who's yeah. there. Yeah. And people are really open with that because I, I do the same. And, and people are more than happy to talk about their home and their area. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, it's a non-invasive and it's a, it's a non, you know, non-aggressive. It's a very calm way to open a conversation. Um, oh, you know, it was why this person's knocking on my door. No, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm actually hoping you could help. And, and so anyway, um, I ended up going back to that house next door, which I'll call the blue house think on about five occasions at different times of day and different days over the next few days. There was never anyone in. Anyway, found the guy when he was in and I said, look, you know, what's it like living here? Blah, 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 blah. I'm looking at buying the house next door. And I could see inside immediately in the hall, his house was in the same state as the one that was on the market. Um, and I thought, you know, just, just the gardens unkept and untidy and unloved and overgrown. It just kind of gave me that feeling. I said, look, I'm, I'm buying the house next door. What do you think about selling me this one? Have ever thought about selling it? He, and he went, funnily enough, I would sell it to you, but I just agreed to sell it to someone else. And I, I, I kept a straight face, but inside, <laughs> oh, died a little bit. 
I knew this two bed house could be a five bed all on suite HMO yeah. without any extension or any structural work. It was, it was just set up for it because it had the two receptions on the ground floor, yep. kitchen at the back, two bedrooms on the first floor and a bathroom at the back with a separate toilet that was so big you could amalgamate that into to one ensuite room. So I said, so I, I took his number said, look, well, you know, can I take your number and, and stay in touch? And he said, yeah, that's fine. And I said, look, you know, is there any way that you would let me buy it, even if I you know, paid you a little bit more money? And what I actually really liked about his response, and I really respected his response, was, Rob, I've made an agreement. So even if you offer me to pay me more money, I'm going to go with the people that have I've already yeah, agreed. And I was like, do you know what? I really like you. So I took his, took his number down, and I said, um, I said, if anything happens, here's my number. Please call me. I'll come around. So I left. And about um, three or four days later, so again, this, the fortune is in the follow-up, right? He had cards. I saw he had like this little old cork board with like, you know, cards and flyers and stuff. And there was a couple of these We Buy Any House type cards on there with people's faces and numbers. So he had people interested. And anyway, I messaged him two or three days later to say, Hiya, it was lovely to meet you. Um, really interested in the house. This is my number just to make sure you've got it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just like a follow-up text. Yeah, of course, yeah. Stay in touch. And I didn't hear anything for about a week. He didn't even reply. So I thought, maybe I've taken the number down wrong. So what I did is I did a handwritten note. Yeah, handwritten note in a bright yellow envelope. Hey, yeah, it was lovely to meet you the other day. Um, I didn't hear back from you on the text, so just wanted to leave this note in case um, I've taken your number down wrong or something like that. And hand delivered it through the door. And uh, he calls me the next day, Rob, the sales fallen through. The reason he hadn't texted me back is he doesn't use, he doesn't text. He was reading out a text. Um, but, you know, so how did I get that deal? So I spotted something that 30 other people didn't spot. No one else went next door to knock on his door from those people viewing the yellow house. Yep. Right? Not only that, when he wasn't in, I didn't go, oh, he's not in. I'm going to go home and forget about this. I went back four, five, six, however many times it took to, to catch him in. Made the introduction, got his number, made that connection, followed it up with a, a text, nothing happened, followed it up with a letter. And when he called to say the sales fallen through, I think he called me in the afternoon. I said, I'll be there the next morning. Yeah. Okay. So 9 a.m. I had me, I had the project manager, I had the builder, all there looking around. They're looking around. She's at the top of the stairs going, I'm going, like, looking at her, trying to say, give me a thumbs up or not. <laughs> like, I do. It was a yes, but I wanted someone else to confirm. Yeah. Without going, is it this sort of, because he's standing. <laughs> and so she's at the top of the stairs going, yes, yes. <laughs> Get it. So then I'm in the hallway not wanting to leave that house until I've, I've done a handshake agreement with him. Because I knew if he made a handshake agreement with me there and then, I'm getting that house. Because of what he said about the other people. Once I've made an agreement, I've made an agreement. And I like doing business like that. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I agreed to buy it. And, and I got it. And then that became a, a, a five-bed all-on suite HMO. Um, and that was on my Facebook somewhere. Uh, so I got that for 168500 and then we, we, we revalued that at 290 Wow. Which is great, yeah. And then, funnily enough, I bought that house, the blue house. I bought it. I did it up and had it rented all in the time that I still hadn't even completed on the yellow house. And then we go back to the yellow house. And again, not always the higher offer is going to be accepted. My offer was my offer because that's what worked numbers-wise. Yep. Okay. Um, and and they knew that I would buy it. It took 18 months to buy that house. There's no first time buyer or, or people with funding and stuff like that that are gonna wait around for that kind of time. But I did. Yeah. Yeah, I waited, I was patient. 18 months it took to complete on that. And I tell you what, that's the hardest completion I've ever had in my life. So much so that at one point the funding did actually get pulled. The bridging lender on that pulled the funding because it was about an eight week period where we were supposed to complete it. It just didn't happen. Obviously they're, they're paying for those credit lines. Again, relationships is everything. 
they wanted to lend to me and the deal because they knew the deal and me and the broker helping on that deal at the time. And because of that, the funding came back. Yep. They didn't say, look, we're done with you. That's all of these little things can be the difference between, between an income and not. And on those houses, what's great is we used a cross security strategy. So at the time I didn't have the funds available to buy those houses for the deposit and the works to be done. So most people go, uh, I think I had one or the other. I had the, uh, I had the deposit or I had the fund, uh, the refurb because it was about the same amount of money. Right. Yeah. I didn't have both. So I wouldn't have been able to do those deals, either of them, but we used a cross security strategy. So we brought in another property that didn't have a mortgage on it. And we got one bridge across two properties. What that allowed us to do on the blue house that allowed me a hundred percent of the purchase price. So no deposit necessary, hundred percent of the purchase price plus money towards the stamp duty and the legal fees, a little bit extra. That's what we did on the blue house. So then I just had to fund the refurb, which was great. Then I refinanced it on the yellow house. We did the same thing, but this time we got a hundred percent of the purchase price plus 50 grand towards the refurb all released day one, not even in tranches Yep. by using that other thing. And then I'm refinancing. That's just been valued at three, two, five. And we've had our offer and we're refinancing now. And to pay back the bridge is like two, five, six. Brilliant. And 80% of three, two, five is two, five, six. So the bridge gets cleared and I end up with the property. So I've got two properties worth two ninety and three, two, five. And each one, the rental's about two eight on each one, right? Call it uh, net is about uh, two five altogether, two thousand five hundred net for both of them, and it's a little bit it, it's a it's a little bit low because I've got finance with some of the venture asset leasing finance, so that will go more up to towards the three k mark in a, like a couple of years. But the concept for people to grasp here is I own two properties that bring me in an amount of money that is net probably more than most people's wages. Yep. And I didn't have the money to do those deals. That, you really got to rewind that bit and listen to that again. I've got two properties that will forever bring me in two and a half K net or more. And I didn't have the money to do those deals, but because I had the the relationships, the connections and the the knowledge on how to do the finance in terms of the bridging, I have those deals. That brings me, that brings me quite nicely to the, to the next question I've got for you. So, so you've sort of alluded to a couple of people there and you mentioned when you was in the, in the, in the potential HMO that you brought some people with you. So there's that core team. So who's your, not, not personally, but who are your, key people and and how have you found them what are the relationships with them and what value do they bring to to you moving forward so so number one is a solicitor now i'm very fortunate in that i've had the same firm of solicitors acting for me for like 12 years now they've done my first ever property purchase and they've done every one since so when there's you know personal guarantees needed and all this extra bits and bobs i don't get crucified on the rates extra things they tend to just do for me which is brilliant right and in return guess what i do i send them business because they look after me right they look after me they treat me well as a client so when people say to me rob i need a recommendation for solicitor there you go okay and there are three solicitors within that firm that i use depending on what i'm doing yeah and then i'll and then also i say to those solicitors if i send you anyone don't mess them around if you can't handle it you say you're too busy turn the business away. There's, there's plenty of other solicitors. Yeah. Um, so solicitor is one. And then the other thing is, is it's got to be a solicitor that's going to have your back. So I'm buying another one at the moment. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a leasehold house. Okay? It's a really, really good deal. Um, got it for, for circa 100K and it will revalue at about 175. And we're just going to flip it. Um, and there was a, a part in the lease 
I, I said to the solicitor, I said, look, I have to bid today. It's one of these modern method of auctions where you have to put down a deposit. So I have, to, I have to be able to put that money down today. He said, send the lease over. So he has a look through it, comes back, you know, critical issue, this line here. In other words, long story short, you can't use it as a buy to let. You can, own, you can only be an owner occupier. Okay, can I buy this, do it up and flip it to someone else? He said, if you're doing it up to sell it to someone else, I've got no problem with it. But if you're doing it up as a buy to let, you can't do it. Yep. So we start negotiating with the freeholder and getting the leases changed and all of that. But, you know, once you've agreed to buy something in auction, you're in. Yeah. So, so we went down the lines of on this one, look, you know, we're going to do, we're going to buy it. We're going to do it as a flip. But whilst, and that's our, that's our exit. And because it's a cash purchase, we're not using bridging. We're not worried about the time it takes. We're not worried about, you know, going over on funding, stuff like that. Um, so, so yeah, so that's the importance of having a good solicitor because I don't know what I'm looking for in a lease. Yeah, of course. I'm not a solicitor. So I could have gone, yeah, let's do it. Committed myself and my joint venture partner's money to this and then gone, oh shit. You know, so that's why you've got to have, but you've got to have someone that can get back to you quickly. That would not have worked if this list is going to take a week to get back to me on it. Yeah. I lost that deal. So that deal could be worth 40 or 50 pounds <laughs> if we flip that. So that's your solicitor. That's your solicitor. Uh, project manager. So um, I hate paperwork. Everyone's got their genius. Everyone's got their strengths. Paperwork is not mine, but I know it and I, I'm okay with that. So, you know, um, things like sorting out the bills and the council tax and the connections and all of that sort of stuff, sorting out builders. So for me, having a project manager is great because you've got to organize and manage a multitude of people, but there's timings involved as well, right? Because you've got to do the rip out and no one can go in until that's been done. And then a plumber's got to do certain things and then an electrician's got to do certain things before the builder goes in and starts plastering all yeah. over. So the, pro the project manager is one of those ones that a lot of people think they can do themselves. And, and to, to an extent, obviously, you can bumble along and, everyone, and, you, and you can do it. But whenever you watch like Grand Designs or something like that, you can tell the difference of the speed and the efficiency on a project with a project manager versus when they're self-managing it. And it's one of those ones you look at it and you think that's an expense that I can save by doing myself, but it does it cost you more further down the line? And I think more often than not, it probably Well, here's does. the thing. If, if, you use, if you use that as a really good example, let's say this one I've just done, this bridge... This bridge I'm on right now for this HMO is about two and a half thousand pounds a month, right? So let's say I do it myself, project manager myself. I know I'm going to run over because I know I'm going to put my paperwork off. And if I put my paperwork off, the builder's not going to know what to do and when, or the architect's not going to get what he needs to give to the builder, to give to the plumber, right? I'm, I'm going to forget to contact the plumber to say, you've got to go in tomorrow because three days later, the electrician, right? So if I do it myself, I'm going to save 10% on everything, but it's going to cost me seven and a half grand in time. Because it could take me three months longer to do it than, than to set it and forget it with someone else. And especially if you're on the bridges or you're on yeah. the quick flip. You can't uh, mess around on a bridge. You is, can't. Time is money and it's like... Yeah. yeah. So, so what you've what you got to think is, well, if it's going to cost me seven and a half grand to do it myself in the extra time, if this project manager costs me seven and a half grand or less, I should be doing that. Because it costs me six grand I'm, I'm 1,500 quid better off because I haven't cocked it up myself, <laughs> right? And I haven't had the, all of those... I'm not doing any work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if it costs me exactly seven and a half grand, then I do it because I'm no better, no worse off, but I've had six, seven months of not having to do any of that stuff, which means I can focus on, like, money-generating activities elsewhere, okay? So, yeah, so project manager, oh, she's got to have a good build team. You've got a good build team. I'm very lucky the build team that I've got, um, they all know each other. So there's a plumber, electrician, and a builder. They all know each other. They've all worked on HMO projects before. 
and um, and they they just know what they're doing. They really know what they're doing. They do it to a high standard as well. Yeah, um, agents like you know, the, like I said, the difference between getting a property or not could be your relationship with the agent. And when I say your relationship, I don't mean your best itch, your mate. It, it's not that. I mean your relationship in how that agent sees you. What, let's say you and me are going for the same property. Why is the agent going to recommend? The seller chooses. The seller chooses who gets that property. But why is the agent going to recommend me over you? Have you pulled out of the last two sales with that agent? Have you changed your mind? Have you been a knob? Have you just been difficult and pernickety over every thing? And have I gone in and the past three things that I've agreed to buy with that agent, I've bought them and I've bought them within 28 days on bridging and I've got it done. Because ultimately the seller wants to sell. Yeah. They might have another property. So, you know, I might offer 150 and you might offer 152, but that extra two grand is no good if you waste four months of that seller's time and pull out the day of exchange. Yeah. That's cost them way more than two grand if they lose the, their dream home etc so it's very very important to do what you say you're going to do and have those relationships with people you know um who else obviously you as in you yourself is 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 the one of the most important people of the team and you know you've got to work on you and you've got to work on yourself and and you know have that confidence and you know, you've got that education, you've got that confidence, you know what you're doing, you've just got to be able to, you've got to be able to pull the trigger. And sometimes you've got to be the one to pull everyone together, you know? Um, so, so, yeah, those, those are... Fine out. Fine out. Okay, yeah. Do you know what? <laughs> I, I should say that. There's a reason, obviously, you know the reason why I didn't mention that. So, yeah, finance is obviously very important. <laughs> broker. Okay, you must, that can't be understated. Like, you must have a broker that knows what they're doing in the field in which you know. Sorry, in the field in which you need them, right? So, so for instance, when I left the police, so this brings us nicely round to back to when I left the police, we had discussions about me becoming a broker. Because what I wanted to do when I left the police is I refinanced some property that put money in the bank to allow me to do more property, go full time and, and leave the job. But what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to spend too long living off of that money. So I wanted to generate income in another way um, without kind of having a, a full-time job. So I did my training as a, as a mortgage broker. And then I came and, and worked in your office for a bit. I think it was about a week. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. so I was in there for about a week. This was a couple of years ago. And, uh, and I realized I, it was great. It was great fun, but it was the time. There was so much time needed. Um, I, 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 I'd gone from one job to another. And so I decided, look, that's not what I wanted to do because obviously property is what I wanted to do. So in the end, I just, I just introduced business to you um, that way. And gave then, you good grounding though, didn't it? It gave you that, that all. Oh, 100%. Of step, yeah. 100%. So, so it gave me grounding in, in, well, as a mortgage broker, basically. So I went on and carried on with the property. And then it was around... It was around November last year um, that I decided, look, I've got a lot of time on my hands now. Um, very fortunate, very fortunate. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, there's only so many days that you can do Netflix, PlayStation, the gym and walking the dogs and not have kind of a, a, a bit of a purpose. So, so I decided to go back to being a broker um, and I, I still picked that up at the beginning of this year. And <clears throat> so what I'm doing is really, I'm not doing it as a full-time job at all. I'm doing it as a, as a passion project and I, I'm working with other property investors. Again, usually it's kind of the, the circle of people that I already know that now know that I'm doing, because a lot of the time I was, I was recommending brokers, right? Like, like yourself. Um, and now that they know that I'm doing it, they know me. It's because they know me. If, so if people know, like, and trust you, they're going to want to work with you. But the awesome thing, the awesome thing about the position I'm in, which I, I'm so grateful for and I, I love, is I can choose who I work with. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if, I, if, I, if I have a client that is not 
a great fit for me, then I can, I can tell them I can't help them or I can send them elsewhere, you know, or recommend someone else. Because if they're not a great fit for me, I'm not going to perform my best for them anyway. And ultimately, that's what I want. But I work with people I like. So other property investors doing bridging deals. So that's, that's what I love. I love the art of a deal. And it is, it's an art putting a deal together. It really, really is. And so, and so, yeah, so a broker obviously is very, very important. <laughs> What's quite good is that I can now kind of, I know where to go for my own stuff. Uh, especially bridging in that. So, but, that's, but then that does bring us to, to where we are now and what is next. So what, what you, what's, what's in your future? And then we might have a little bit of an announcement that we might make. Cool. So, so in my future, what have we got going on? So I've got, I've got that one bed house that I'm purchasing. So that's a, a cash purchase with an investor joint venture, 50, 50. Um, they're putting the money in. I'm sorting everything else out. I'm bringing the expertise and the deal to the table. We'll do that. Up. We'll flip it. And then that money, what I like about this investor is he doesn't just want the money. He's like, what are we going to do with it? What do you want to do with it? Let's reinvest it. Cool. So we might make 50 grand profit. And instead of taking 50 grand and buying a Porsche or going on holiday or whatever, we'll take that 50 grand and then we'll park that in an HMO that requires 50 grand to be left in it. Yeah. That sort of stuff, that compounding of that investing. So that's that one. We're buying, um, we're buying uh, another flat that will, we should be able to turn from a one bed into a two bed and refinance, pull some of the money out. Um, I've got my eye on a few bits and bobs. I have my eye on a portfolio. Um, and I don't mind telling you about that, but not on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so we might talk about that uh, separately and sorry to anyone listening, but that one is, that one is, is incredible if, if I get it. And, and I'm not one of these people that's going to go, oh, I've done this, I've done that, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Fire emoji, fire emoji, boom, <laughs> oh, smashing it all over Facebook like people do. And, you know, six months later, they've gone a bit quiet and you never knew what quite happened to that deal. So I tend not to say too much about stuff until it's done. Because then you're not, you know, there's no bullshit around it. Wine in hand, feet are up. Exactly, yeah. So, so I'm hoping that, that that's quite a large portfolio. Um, and if I can do that creatively, that would be an epic podcast session. So, um, yeah. We'll that, that brings us around to something else, doesn't it? So it would be quite nice to keep up to date with how you're getting on, wouldn't it? So I think now's the time to announce that you are going to be the new co-host of the Property Investors podcast. I am. I am. Love. I am. And I'm very excited about it. I'm and really excited about it. Whole episode. This whole episode was like a, a, a sneak preview of why I want Robin to be my co-host. It's, it's, I've known Robin for a long time. Trust Robin. I've seen him complete. As he says, he does what he says he's going to do. And, and I, and I thought that moving forwards, having someone like Robin on the show with me, um, imparting that wisdom of what he's learned and what he's doing but then i also know how well connected robin is and the the guest that we're going to be bringing on and the value that robin can add to those conversations is going to be fantastic so it's an absolute no-brainer for me to have to have you along with me or for the ride um but I've, I've, I, I thought of this before i press record is we are batman and robin because I'm taller and you're shorter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's going to be like that scene out of Only Fools and Horses. Yeah, we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to do, we're going to have to do the running down the road. <laughs> and Short I've got a mate one and a tall, lanky one. Yeah, I've got a mate of mine that has the uh, the three wheeler as well, so we can we can probably get no, yeah, Batman and Robin going. Um, oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah, but on, on that as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of a rebrand as well because it's going to be a bit of a different show. Obviously, we're doing the YouTube stuff. So, so those of you that are watching this on YouTube or Facebook video, you'll know that this is a video. <laughs> but then also we'll still keep the podcast. So you'll still be able to listen to us on Spotify, Apple, Google, um, should be on Amazon pretty soon and all the likes of that. Um, we're looking at changing the name. So Property Investors Podcast, um, we're going to make it a bit more condensed and it's just podcast property, mainly because because we had all of the social handles were podcast property. So it made sense that we just made it all one 
and it just all rather than having a little bit of this and a little bit of that so we are now the podcast property so from episode two which we'll discuss in a second um all the branding is going to change i'm going to go into the system I'm going to change all the past stuff to season one episode one two etc and it's going to be season two and this is going to be the future um we've had confirmation this morning from our very first well our second but mine and robin's very first guest together so robin do you want to announce who the next guest is going to be yeah so he's actually a personal friend of mine he's an absolute legend um he's very down to earth he's very very knowledgeable uh, in the property kind of market, he's he's got a property portfolio himself. He deal sources property onto other investors, uh, and he trains uh, people in property. And it is the the one and only Mr. David Siegler who uh, will be coming on next week as our first guest. Fantastic! I'm really looking forward to that. I won't, I would I, I've, we've got a really exciting story of how me and Robin met met David Siegler. So I'll but I'll hold that for the episode, and I'm going to see if David can remember because it was a couple of years ago now, and it was a bit of a unique, a bit unique meeting. Um, but no, I'm really excited about this, Robin. This is going to be an exciting future, I think. Yeah, no, I, I think it's going to be great. It'll be good, it'll be good fun, whatever happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, for those of you that are first tuning in or or new to us so follow us on all the socials we're at podcast property on instagram twitter facebook we are going to be setting up a brand new group so we have a new facebook group that i'm going to launch today um we're going to we will eventually have it as a paid for group because we want to keep the standard in there really really high but for the first hundred people that join the group it's going to be free there's going to be some questions so it is going to be applied entry Um, we're going to invite some people that we know into it. And the idea is that we want to, I hate the word mastermind, but we're going to try and keep a really close knit community of genuinely, um, that people are involved in property. So anyone that that fancies that they can buy themselves into the group, but for the first hundred that join, it's going to be completely free. Um, the website, I'm going to change to podcastproperty.co.uk, but you can still get us at property investors podcast. Um, but yeah, I think, and then remember to, I've not, I've not done this before. I've not done YouTube, but like subscribe, follow <laughs> comment in the section, do all of that sort of stuff. Um, and then we'll be back next week and we're going to, we're going to record them on Mondays and we're going to get them out on Tuesdays. Gives me some time to edit. And then if we have extra long episodes, we might do a Tuesday and a Thursday and break it into two. Today's been quite long, isn't it, Robin? So I, I might break this into two episodes. To So those that have only listened to the first half will probably have to get a little bit of a stretch out. Um, but yeah, we'll see you next week. So you got to say goodbye as well. This is, you're on the oh, podcast. Yeah. You're, you're so co-host. Nice to your new co-host. See you later. <laughs> go on in. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What do you want me to do? <laughs> no, that was good. <laughs> All right, I've got to press pause or stop now. All right, stop the recording.